just one I want to mention is, is Thursday, the 8th of December, men alive, uh, going out go-karting. Uh, I don't know if that's wise, two weeks or so before Christmas, but uh, going go-karting. If you're interested, gentlemen, uh, please speak to Noel or Alan Reid and get your name down. Those are the announcements we're here to worship. And today's the first Sunday in Advent. That season of waiting, a season of expectation. And the Jewish nation waited and is still waiting for the promised Messiah. The one that the Old Testament said would come. Prophets like Jeremiah who said, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. And he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. The Jews, nation, long and still long for this one to come and give them victory and to reign over their land. But we who are Christians know that Christ has come and we also know that he has promised to come again to bring an end to this evil world and to establish a new heaven and a new kingdom. And so our hearts cry, should you come, O long-expected Jesus? Let's praise him.
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we enter indeed this Advent season, this season of waiting and, and looking forward with great expectation, preparations are, are ramping up. We are getting ready for the big day in, in a few weeks. That day when we will celebrate the coming of that long-expected Jesus, the coming of your son to that stable in Bethlehem long ago. We will come and celebrate and, and praise you and thank you for the wonderful hope that was born that night when your son came to earth, took on flesh in order to redeem his people from their sin, to rescue them from a lost eternity. Father, gifts will be exchanged in the coming weeks, but there is no greater gift than the gift of your amazing love, your grace, and your mercy given to us through Christ, a gift that not one of us deserved. And Father, why we will look back and celebrate and rejoice at that first coming. We yearn for Christ to return sooner rather than later. The cry, come Lord Jesus, come, is, is frequently on, in our minds and on our lips as we watch this, this world around us drift further and further from you. And Father, you're so faithful. You're so patient despite the sin of this world. We are reminded in Scripture that you do not wish that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Thank you for being so long-suffering, Father. Thank you for being the one who forgives all of our sins through Christ. But our hearts are burdened. We know that not all will come to repentance. We know that many will just harden their hearts against you, no matter how much the good news of the gospel is presented. Father, may that break our hearts. And may that drive us and motivate us to greater acts of service and proclamation. Fill us with that desire as deep as your own for the lost that sacrificed everything to re redeem them. Help us to live lives that reflect what a great God that you are. Help us to take the, opportunity that, the opportunities that will come our way to speak of the great, gracious, merciful, forgiving God that you are, to speak of the hope that we have as we enter into this Christmas season, that wonderful gift of salvation that you have made available through your perfect Son, the Lord Jesus. So, Father, there are days when we, we're honest, we're overwhelmed, and we despair, and we just wonder, what's the point? We're overcome by the lostness of this world. And that deepens our desire for, to want you to come and bring us home. And so, Lord, while we, we ask you to motivate us and drive us to acts of service, we pray, Lord Jesus, come. Come now. Come soon. Bring us home. And we ask us in and through the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Boys and girls, you want to come to the front? Go on, come to the front. guys come on curl around a wee bit come on around a wee bit so we can see you come on ahead well right somebody tells me christmas is coming is it yeah, yeah? how do you know 
you're on the ball. The Christmas decorations are going up. You're right. There are lots of clues around, aren't there, that, that Christmas is coming. We don't need to look at the calendar or anything. Lots of things are going up. Uh, and, and even our tree went up or, or started to go up on, on Friday night. And there are lots of things that you'll see. As you say, decorations, here we go. Hold on. Oh, it's buried in the bottom of my bag. <coughs> Tinsel. It'll come out in a wee second, isn't it? Um, what do we need for the trees? What else do we need for the trees? Bubbles. I have a box of bubbles here. What's it say in those bubbles? Shout it out. What's it say? Where are they from? What's that say? I don't know whether you just don't want to say it or not. I'm sure you're able to read. No. Here. You should know that from your house, you're big football fans. Good old Manana, Leeds United, yep, there we go, get that up there. That's the first my wife realises we have those. <laughs> so I'm glad it's a soup lunch today. Um, so that, um, maybe some of you will have oh, one of these up in your house, like a, a calendar type thing where you can, uh, you can do a countdown to how many days that are coming to Christmas. That'll have to go up in our house and you turn it around each day so you know what's getting closer. What do you think that is? What's that smile say? Do you know what that smile's about? Tablet. Or Maybe you get lots of leads at your house. There's a wee van scoots up your, your lane. Amazon. Does it start coming up your lane a whole lot more, coming closer to Christmas, all those presents being delivered? It's up your tablet, I know. So maybe you'll be seeing lots of that and wondering, is that for me? Or is that my dad just not going to the shops and buying stuff for my mum online? Like that's more like it, to be honest. I'll leave that there. What else do I have? People start set dressing up silly, don't they? They start wearing these silly jumpers. I wasn't wearing that last night. I was not wearing that last night. But yes, I was. Or you can really go to town. Some people wear Santa hats. There we go. He has to wear that around school all the time. Uh, so people start doing things because they know Christmas is coming and lots of decorations go up around the house like the wee snowman. Maybe. Who has these sitting? Oh, look at those hands go up. Yes. Do you know when you open the first one? Thursday. Thursday's first of December, isn't it, I think? Great, so we have those in our house. And if anybody gives me a good name for our December song next week, you get one of these. There you go, that's your prize. So get thinking this week. Christmas is coming. There are lots of signs, lots of, lots of things that let us know that Christmas is, is very, very close. And we get our, our TV adverts for all our toys and pre presents. We get Christmas music, which is good. We I started my Christmas music on, on Friday when I was in the study. Uh, we get all those sorts of things coming. There's lots and lots of signs telling us the big day is getting closer. Very first Christmas, no TV, no radio, no Christmas trees going up, no big announcements like that to tell people that it was Christmas time, that Jesus was coming. There was no big announcement like that for, the, for everybody to see. And he was born, very, very few people knew about it. The shepherds knew because the angels came, the wise men knew because they had been looking for it, but very, very few people knew about it. Everybody was waiting for it as we were thinking about it at the start because they'd heard for years and years and years through all the Old Testament uh, scriptures that this king would come one day, but they didn't know when it was going to be. And they were looking forward to it, waiting and waiting and waiting. And that's what Advent means when I was talking about it earlier. It means about waiting looking forward to something happening, but waiting for it to happen. And we are in that period of waiting when we will one day in a few weeks come together and celebrate the birth of Jesus, who is the saviour of the world, who came, came to rescue us. But Jesus also made a promise, not only to come that first time, but to come back. We were thinking about that in our prayers, that Jesus said he will come back one day. And just as people 2,000 years ago were waiting for this promised one that God said would come to them, Many, many people, those who believe in Jesus, are waiting now. They just cannot wait for him to come back. But nobody knew when he was coming the first time, and nobody knows when he's coming the second time. Not a clue when it's going to happen. 
It's not marked on our, our calendar. You can't flick through calendars, even with the wonderful, wonderful ones on your phone that give you all those holidays in advance. It doesn't say when Jesus is coming. This is what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son. Jesus didn't know when he was going to return, but only the Father. And this is what he says to us as we're waiting. You also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. We're getting ready for Christmas, aren't we? Doing our shopping, getting decorations up. Some of you are getting ready for a school play uh, in, in a couple of weeks' time. So there's lots of getting ready to celebrate the coming of Jesus. But many of us are ready for him to come back again. Many of us are ready if he were to turn up today. How do we get ready? Well, we give our lives to Jesus. We, we trust him as our Lord, the person in charge of our lives, and we trust him as the only Savior, the one who can rescue us from our sin and forgive us and bring us to heaven. Are you getting ready? Got your decorations out? Got your advent calendars and your silly hats and all the rest of it? Are you ready for Christmas to celebrate Jesus coming? But more importantly, are you ready for Jesus to come back again? Let's pray and then we'll sing a song. Father, thank you for this wonderful time of the year. Thank you for all the excitement uh, that we'll be building in, in the next few weeks. Uh, Lord, as we get closer to Christmas Day and be able to rip open our presents and enjoy a, a, a wonderful meal with family and, and friends. Uh, and we thank you for what it means to so many of us. We praise you. And it's a time when we remember. We remember the greatest gift. The greatest gift that you promised in sending your son, Jesus, and Father, we thank you that one day he's coming back again. And for all who know him, love him, trust him, he will bring to a wonderful place. He will bring us into your presence in heaven where everything will be perfect forevermore. So Lord, thank you for your great gift. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing. We're going to sing it loud. This is a wonderful story we have of why we celebrate Christmas and we should be telling others. Because everybody, other people think it's just about the trees and the parties and the prezies and the food. But really it's all about Jesus and what he has to give us. So we should be living out and telling people. We should be letting our little light shine so people would see our Father in heaven and glorify him. Let's stand saying this little light now. guys enjoy children's church turn with me please to the book of joshua look at joshua our last look at joshua before uh, we uh, take a break for Christmas and then pick it up again, God willing, a new year. So Joshua chapter 7. 
Joshua uh, chapter 7. Let's hear the word of God as we find it in this passage of the Old Testament. But the people of Israel broke faith in regard to the devoted things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took some of the devoted things. And the anger of the Lord burned against the people of Israel. Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near beth Even, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. And the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, Do not have all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and attack Ai. Do not make the whole people toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men went up there from the people, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai killed about 36 of their men and chased them before the gate as far as Sebarim uh, and struck them in the, at the descent. And the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening. He and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all? To give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us. Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what can I say when Israel has turned their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? The Lord said to Joshua, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and put them among their own belongings. Therefore, the people of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies because they have become devoted for destruction. I will be with you no more unless you destroy the devoted things from among you. Get up, consecrate the people and say, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, there are devoted things in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take away the devoted things from among you. In the morning, therefore, you shall be brought near by your tribes, and the tribe that the Lord takes by lot shall come near by clans, and the clan that the Lord takes shall come near by households, and the household that the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And he who is taken with the devoted things shall be burned with fire, he and all that he has, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he has done an outrageous thing in Israel. So Joshua rose early in the morning and brought Israel near tribe by tribe, and the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought near the clans of Judah, and the clan of the Zerahites was taken. And he brought near the clan of the Zerahites man by man, and Zabdi was taken. And he brought near his household man by man, and Achan, the son of Carmi, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, my son, give glory to the Lord God of Israel and give praise to him. And tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. And Achan answered Joshua, truly I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful cloak from Shinar and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold weighing 50 shekels, then I coveted them and took them. And see, they were hidden in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and behold, it was hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. And they took them out of the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the people of Israel. And they led them down before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the cloak and the bar of gold and his sons and daughters and his oxen and donkeys and sheep and and his tent, and all that he had. And they brought them up to the valley of Echor. And Joshua said, why did you bring trouble on us? The Lord brings trouble on you today. And all of Israel stoned him with stones. They burned them with fire and stoned them with stones. 
and they raised over him a great heap of stones that remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his burning anger. Therefore, to this day, the name of that place is called the Valley of Achor. Amen. And we thank God for his word to us. I realize that many of you are not, are not into football. Um, you've absolutely no interest in it, so you probably haven't turned on the TV once this week to uh, see the World Cup and to see what is, what is happening. But let me give you a, a little bit of a feel for it. It's been a fascinating tournament so far. Some major upsets. On Tuesday, Argentina played Saudi Arabia. This was a, a real David and Goliath encounter in, in the World Cup. Argentina were, came into the tournament as one of the favourites to win the competition. They were the third best team in the world. I, I'm, I'm from arguably the best player in the world on, on the left-hand side of the screen here, Lionel Messi. They, as a team, had won 26 games in a row. The last time they were defeated was back in 2019 by Brazil. And the five games before they began the World Cup tournament, they kept five clean sheets and scored 16 times. Seemed invincible. They used the boys to beat. Saudi Arabia, not really renowned for their football. No big names, no superstars. Ranked 51st in the world, the second lowest ranked team in the World Cup. And since 2020, they have won a total of 11 games. Seemed a foregone conclusion, didn't it? It's only going to go one way. So one team is going to get thrashed. Or was it only going to go one way? It certainly started out well. Argentina began strongly on, on the game. They, they scored a penalty. They had three goals ruled out for offside, and then something happened. In the space of five minutes, Saudi Arabia scored two goals. And despite incredible pressure held out to be victorious, David beat Goliath. It wasn't what was expected by any stretch of the imagination. This has turned things around. Argentina, who were up here, and Saudi Arabia who thought, let's just keep the goals to a minimum. It's gone the other way. Saudi Arabia's confidence was on the rise, feeling like they could beat anyone. And Argentina were deflated. People of Israel were on a high. They had just defeated the, the mighty city of Jericho in the most spectacular of fashion. Their reputation as a force to be reckoned with was, was growing, especially as a result of the fact that they had a star player on their side, the Lord God Almighty, who would give them victory over all their enemies. And their opponents fe feared them. We, we, we know that from earlier chapters. Uh, where Rahab said, we've heard of what your God has done and, and, and our hearts have melted. We know you're going to take this land. Victory seemed inevitable to them. Or was it? Or was it? As we turn to, to Joshua 7 and we read it together there, we see an incredible reversal. The unexpected happened. Now, don't get me wrong, Joshua was being very sensible. He didn't rush into this battle. He, 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 he prepared, he sent spies out to check out the enemy and what was, what was ahead of them. And, and they came back and said, do not make all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and attack AI. Do not let make the whole people toil up there, for they are different. Or they are few, sorry. It's like second, send out your second squad because you think the opponents, there's no problem. Don't, don't, don't risk your good players. But things turned out differently very, very quickly. He took the spies' advice. We saw that. He sent about 3,000 men up, uh, up to Ai uh, to try and, and rout the enemy. But as we read, the men of Israel fled, fled before the men of Ai, and 36 were killed. And as a result, and there was no longer the inhabitants of Canaan whose hearts were melting because of fear, but that of the Israelites, as we read together there in verse 5, I think it is. Circumstances have been reversed. The victorious were now defeated and on the run. What went wrong? 
how on earth did they lose to a much weaker opponent after, after wiping out that big, strong city? Well, some say, right, some say they were overconfident. Some say they were overconfident. Just defeated Jericho. Listen, we can beat them. It was easy peasy, lemon squeezy. If we can beat them, we can beat anybody. They were overconfident in their own ability. There's also a lack of prayer. If we read those initial verses, there was no mention of the name of God. There was no mention of seeking God for his guidance. There was no asking, what does the Lord say to me? As Joshua did before they attacked Jericho. There just appears to be no seeking of the Lord at all at this time. And you know, we've talked before in our studies in Joshua, and we've talked about it before, that we are in a battle, a spiritual battle, a spiritual battle for the kingdom of God, a battle to see the honor of God's name restored in our society, a battle to see people set free from the, the power of sin and evil and, and, and come into life and all of its fullness that Christ gives. But we also know that the church is declining. The numbers attending church are down like that, rapidly declining. If you look at the latest census, what is on the increase are those who claim to have no religion, atheists, humanists, whatever title you want to give them. Things are changing. And we see that in the moral and ethical uh, standards of, of our society. Why? Well, we can argue that the church has been overconfident and fails to pray. Overconfident for, because for years the church was a strong influence within our society. People listened to it. People sat up and had respect for its opinions. Attendances were high, um, largely as a result of tradition, if we're honest, and habit. And it was a socially acceptable thing to do. We didn't, the church didn't have to do much. Let's just sit back and people will come in. People will listen to us. We don't have to work too hard. But friends, society is changing. And we are in a very different climate than we were 30, 40, 50 years ago. People are turning against the church. We have turned our back on our enemies and are fleeing as a result. The church is losing heart. Oops, sorry. And in his dismay at this defeat, Joshua, as we read, tore his clothes, fell on the earth, uh, on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening, he and the elders of Israel. They grieved at this defeat. They were broken by it. And, and, and Joshua's cry, he even suggested that, that it was God's fault. God failed to keep his promises. You said you, said you would bring us into this land, Lord, that we would, we would conquer it. You, you would defeat our enemies for it. W what happened here? Are they going to destroy us now? They blame God. But before we criticize Joshua for accusing God of failing to fulfill his promises, listen to what one commentator, David Jackman, says. Joshua did the right thing with his, his despair. He took it to God. He didn't say the right words. He didn't have the right diagnosis. But he began to open up the situation to the Lord. And then things began to change. So whatever our acts of foolish disobedience or over, overconfident complacency may have produced, perhaps leaving us paralyzed by our helplessness, we need to tell God about it. We may get it all wrong. That doesn't matter. Tell God anyway. It was when Joshua lay before the Lord and laid out his problem that God began to put things right. And friends, turning to God in prayer must be our first response on all occasions, good or, or, or bad. Uh, but as we find time and time again in the Psalms, we must come and fall down before our holy God, pouring out our hearts before him, seeking his forgiveness, seeking his guidance, seeking his will for our lives, and seeking his wisdom. And then things will change. 
we're going to worship God with our offering, presenting to him the gifts that, out of all that he has given to us. And as we do that, we remain in our seats. Um, we'll sing this new song we learnt a couple of months ago, a song that fits in with what Joshua just did in the face of difficulty. We will fall down and worship. before God and, 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 and worship him uh, and seek his face as Joshua did, then he, he always answers our prayers. God always responds. We may not get the answer we want or like, but he always responds. And that was the case with Joshua, as we see in verses 10, uh, 10 to 11, because as God said to him, and uh, it was a bit of a rebuke, he said, get up. Why have you fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. They have transgressed my covenant that I commanded them. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen and lied and, and put them amongst their own problems. And God was saying, hold on, Joshua, I'm not the problem here. I haven't broken my promises. The people have broken their promises to me. They have disobeyed me. They have gone against my word. They have taken things from Jericho that they were commanded either to destroy or to take and place in the temple treasury. They are to blame. And what was the consequence of taking those devoted things? It was that the people of Israel have become devoted for destruction. People who were supposed to destroy what they found in Jericho, now they were the ones who were facing destruction because of their disobedience. This is why AI, this weak opponent, overcame the raiding party that was sent out by Joshua. And so jo God said to Joshua, listen, get up and go and sort the problem. 
Don't moan and groan about it. Get up and go and deal with it. Put everything back in order. Sort your own house out. And God gave instructions as to how that was to be done. And Joshua then went and told the people and warned them that unless we get ourselves right, unless we root out this problem, then AI will not be our only defeat. We will face many more. We need to remedy the issue. In fact, not only would they face defeat, but this is, this is the scary bit, or it should frighten us when we hear it. God said, I will be with you no more. I will be with you no more. Skip forward to Revelation. The seven churches in Revelation. Get your house in order, God says. Get back to doing what you're supposed to do and be, or else I will remove my lampstand from you. Colin Peckham says, this, that is about as serious as it gets because the presence of God is everything. How often our meetings are barren, dry, cold, without conviction and with no sense of the presence of God. What a threat. The divine withdrawal to forfeit that is a disaster. Without the presence of God, Israel had no hope of conquering the promised land and in fact could be wiped off the face of the earth. Without the presence of God, the church is dead and will eventually cease to exist. Go to Revelation. The seven churches, strong churches, active congregations in their community. And many of them are still in existence today. They failed to listen to the warnings that God gave them and he removed the lampstand from their midst. He removed their, his presence from them. Maybe some of you are saying, but Ronnie, we're not as bad as that. And we, we, we're faithful to the word of God. It's pr the gospel is preached faithfully. We, we preach salvation in, in Christ alone through, through faith alone. We haven't drifted from the, the truth as someone's done and, and issues such as marriage and the sanctity of life. And, and we, can, we can have all sorts of arguments saying, Ronnie, we're not like that. We're not like that. But friends, we're not perfect. We're not without sin. We go back to, Eph to Revelation, Ephesus, the church in Ephesus. They were commended for what? Their devotion to the word. They were commended for their hatred of sin and, and false teachers. They were commended for their hard work. But then they were chastised for abandoning their first love. See, folks, they become legalistic. They thought if we ticked all the right boxes, yes, there's the Bible, we preach it. Yes, yes, we, we, we abhor those terrible things that are going on in society. Uh, yet, yes, we'll run all sorts of activities. Tick, tick, we're good. We're a good active church. We'll be all right. But you know what? They forgot that it was about Christ and not about them. They forgot that the church existed to bring glory to Christ first and foremost and not for the reputation of the church of Ephesus. Matthew S. is a contemporary Christian singer, and he, he's a fairly new song out that puts things a bit like this. One life, one mission, one reason why I'm living, all for you, not for me. My story is your glory. And too many of our congregations are, are, are concerned about their own reputation. What do people think of us in First, in first Brashean or Second Brashean or St. Patrick's or Third Valley Go Backwards? They're worried about us and how we're worried about us but we forget more about God's reputation. What shall, well, what will you do for your great name? So while we seem to be doing all the right things, if we're not doing it for the right reason, all for God and not for us, then God will remove his presence from our midst. And Rico Tice, I was listening to him speak at a conference. He said, even the tiniest spiritual objective becomes impossible. Stark warning. Someday, some Wednesday night, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that Rico Tice talk up. It was amazing and challenging. Um, he was speaking to pastors at a conference in America. But friends, the problem is not just a corporate issue of, of 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 the wider church or the congregation. It's a personal issue about you and me as individuals. 
not one of us is perfect without sin. And again, some will say, well, listen, Ronnie, we, we don't deliberately uh, and blatantly disobey God as Achan did. Yes, we don't always get it right, but we're not that bad. Friends, we still disobey God. We still commit sin against him. Remember years ago, I picked up uh, this book from the bookshelves uh, of, of the Faith Mission Store because the title grabbed me. <coughs> Respectable Sins. Respectable sins. Is there really such a thing as a respectable sin? And then when I lift it up, I look down, and then it says, confronting the sins we tolerate. It deals with issues such as our discontentment, our unthankfulness, our ungratefulness, our selfishness, our impatience, our irritability, our judgmentalism, the sins of the tongue, which we studied last year in James, our worldliness, and a number of other things. Things that we easily dismiss as being, oh, don't worry about that, it's not that important. It's not a major moral or ethical issue. Or, or, or a, it's just who they are, it's just their character, it's just their personality, just ignore it. But as you read through this book, as Bridges explains, each of every one of those respectable sins is still sinful. It's just as bad as stealing or murder or adultery or the other big sins as they are sometimes described. Let me read from Colossians where Paul says we are to put off anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another. You see, sins we sometimes overlook, oh, they're, just, they're just a wee bit sharp on it. They don't really mean what they say. Or they don't engage their brain before they speak and, and they regret afterwards what, the, what came out of their mouth. But friends, these sins, and they are sins, are as destructive as any other. They cause division. They cause bitterness. They cause hostility. They cause harm little devotional blog I was reading said this none of us should think that our private sins will not have an effect on others persistent impenitent serious sin can bring shame on the church and mar its holiness friends the outside world looks on us as a church it looks at how we behave and how we we treat each other and how we treat people out about in the world and, and how what our priorities are in life and if it goes against what we, we, we claim to believe, they want nothing to do with us. I don't even bother going there. A bunch of hypocrites. Biggest accusation against the church. Bunch of hypocrites. They say this, they do that. They diddle me in business. They've treated, spread rumors behind my back. Say they're good living. Say they're born again. What do they want anything to do with that? Someone said, if our congregations begin to harbor and tolerate and secretly condone what Jesus hates, then we will fa shall find Jesus acting to discipline us and even withdraw from us. Friends, if we claim to belong to the Lord, if we claim uh, to, to, to have a relationship with Christ as Lord and Savior, then we must be changed people. We must be changed people. 2 Corinthians 5, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Or Ephesians 4, we are to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Finally, Romans 8 and 29, for those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be what? Conformed to the image of his son. We're to be changed people. When we become a child of God, it's just not a matter to say that we've been forgiven, we're saved. But it's a process. We are to work out our salvation. We are to become different people with different attitudes and behaviors and priorities and characteristics. We are to strive to become more like Jesus, to reflect who he is. So the question I want to ask is this. Are we different people compared to what we were like before we gave our lives to Christ? 
Are we different people compared to what we were 12 months ago? Six months ago? A week ago? Are we becoming more like the one who saved us? Friends, this sin had to be dealt with. It had to be dealt with to remind the people of God's holiness, his abhorrence of sin, and his need to punish it. It had to be dealt with to also remind the people of their responsibility to, to, to obey the commands of the Lord, as, as, as have been said back in chapter 1, that they had to come careful to, to do according to all the law that Moses commanded. In verse 16 on, we see that. Moses, or Joshua did that. He worked through the Lord's commands of how to find the guilty party, each tribe, each clan, each family, until Achan was identified, the spotlight came onto him. Now, something I say, and rightly so, listen, when, when Joshua got up and said, this is what we're going to do, guys, Achan, Achan, why didn't you not step forward? Just speed the process up in a bit. I got it. It's me. I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong. He wasn't an ignorant man because he knew all about what God had done. He had, he had journeyed with them. He knew what type of God was like. He, he, he knew that God knew everything. And surely the alarm bells were ringing. But, but, but he kept his head down, folks. He didn't come forward. He didn't admit his guilt. Maybe for some reason, foolishly, he was hoping it would pass over him. But it wasn't. God picked him out and brought him before the people. And he was declared guilty. And then somebody may feel sympathetic for him because he said, did he not confess? I have sinned against the Lord, God of Israel. Did he not confess? But, well, John Calvin said this, that he can give no sure indication of repentance, being, as it were, overcome with terror. He openly divulged what he would willingly have concealed. So only because he was put under the spotlight, he admitted what he had done. And many of us have been there at some point, particularly as children. Cast your minds back, those of you, as you have to do that, or... Those of you are still in that bracket of children living at home. Something is broken in the house. Something goes missing. Along with your siblings, the Adam, you were gathered together. You were questioned as to who did it. Who was to blame? Everybody keeps their head down and their mouths shut. What's the consequence of doing that? Everybody is punished. Sent to their room, given extra chores to do, whatever. And that's what happened here. That's what happened here. Achan's family and the whole of Israel was under the, the judgment of God. Some may find that harsh. It was one man. Why did his family suffer? Well, let's be honest. In those days, they didn't have nice houses with garages where he could have slipped in the back door and hidden stuff under boxes. He lived in a tent. He had to bring it in through the only entrance and dig a hole in the ground and bury it so the whole family knew what was going on. And so they deserved to be punished. But going back to that childhood illustration, when the truth comes out, who was actually the guilty party? They suffer a greater punishment, don't they? They suffer a greater punishment because they were found out. And I don't know if this was ever said to you. It was said to me. And we are like our parents, aren't we? We just repeat what they said to us. If only you told the truth at the start, rather than lying, it wouldn't be as bad. If only he had stood up and told the truth at the start. And friends, that's why what Aiken said wasn't a true confession. It's not that he came forward with a guilty conscience and, and, and knew he was wrong. He was caught red-handed and had no choice but to admit it. And friends, are we any different? Maybe more in time and time again of the consequences of our sin and our rejection of God. Of disobeying his commands. We've been warned that judgment will come upon all those who reject Christ. But for some reason, some reason, people, some people still live the way they want it. Hoping that the, they can get that last chance for a deathbed confession, so to speak. But friends, many do not get that chance. Because we do not know when we will be called to stand before the throne of judgment. When it will be too late to confess our sins and receive forgiveness. So friends, this morning, don't be an Aiken. 
Don't think that by keeping your head down, you'll be all right. God won't see your sin. Psalm 44 reminds us that God knows the secrets of the heart. We can't hide anything from God. Friends, the church is in decay. It's in decline. Our society is, is becoming increasingly godless and corrupt and immoral. What's the solution? The gospel of Jesus Christ. That's it. The gospel of Jesus Christ can change things. But if the church is not living on obedience to its Lord and King, if we are not walking in his ways and obeying his commands, then the Lord will be with us no more. He will withdraw his presence and we will continue to decay. And I said, I know it's the desire of many hearts in this place and many churches to see the kingdom of God grow, to see lives transformed and our society transformed by the gospel of Jesus Christ. But friends, if we want to see that happen, happen we want to need to stop blaming others. Maybe even we're accusing God and we need to look at ourselves. We need to examine ourselves in the light of Scripture as individual people and as a corporate group, of, as a congregation. And we need to come before the Lord and repent of our sin. We need to come before the Lord and confess our failure to live as Jesus lived. Of how we fail to reflect his image in our daily living. And to recognize, go back to that Matthew West song, one reason why we're living all for God, not for us. Friends, we want to see the church grow. We want to see people rescued and redeemed. Well then, listen to the words that were given to Joshua. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do it according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Amen. And we thank God for his word and spirit to help us walk in its ways. We turn for a brief moment's prayer and it is with regret that I have to announce the death on Tuesday past of Miss Elizabeth Hunter, Craig Dunn Nursing Home and formerly of 63 Tullymore Road. A short service was held up at the, the family home on Friday followed by a committal in Second Bushane Cemetery. And we remember her brother Robert, her nieces Shirley and Karen, nephew William, and the wider family circle in prayer. Let's bow in prayer together. Father God, we, we, we do want to uphold one another as well. We are, we are commanded, uh, Lord, to, to, to care for one another, to pray for one another, to encourage one another. Father, we have this corporate responsibility to, to the wider uh, congregation. And Father, we do want to pray for those who mourn at this time, uh, and a, a very, very difficult time of the year as we come into what is really a time of celebration, and yet it's a very painful time for so many. And we do pray, uh, Lord, for uh, Elizabeth's family. We think of Robert, Lord, her brother, and we think of Shirley and Karen and William and, and the whole family circle who, who will miss someone uh, who, who had such a massive influence on all of their lives throughout the years, one who devoted herself to family. And so, Father, as they adjust to this change in their lives, as we pray for all those who mourn, we pray for your comfort and your, your compassion, your uh, healing power and your strength to help them. And, Father, for your spirit to come and help them to lift their eyes to Jesus and find in him their, their refuge and their mighty fortress. So Lord, we surround them uh, with our prayers and ask you to come and dwell in their midst. Father, we want to thank you for yesterday and the great evening we had in the hall for everyone who, who gave of their time and energy and, and Lord, to, to open the doors and, and just to invite people in. Thank you for the many, many who came through the door. Thank you for the, the carols that were sung, for the refreshments that were served and for the little leaflets that were given out and Bibles and, and books, Lord. Uh, put into people's hands to tell of the wonderful story of Christmas. We pray that they will not just be chucked in a corner or left on the, the floor of the car, but people will open them and, and flick through them, Lord, and be reminded of, of why we, we do celebrate this, this festive season, and, and Lord, that you would speak to them through that and, and cause them to rethink and cause them to be maybe curious and want to come back and hear more. 
Father, we pray for, for our, the nation of Qatar. It's in our, our media, the, the World Cup. It's, it's got a lot of criticism because of its, its strict laws, its strict Islam, Islamic laws. But we thank you for your children who are in that. Despite being a, a country where it's uh, I- illegal to uh, convert to Christianity, uh, and, and there are all sorts of implications to that. Thank you that there is a, a degree of freedom for those foreigners who come to work and live there, that they can worship in freedom. And so, Father, we pray for those, that small number of believers that you would watch over them and you would help them create opportunities where they can share the gospel of Christ with their, their, their neighbors, with their work colleagues, or, or whoever uh, they engage with, and, and that your church will grow and continue to grow because we know what it is. And so, Father, we pray that your spirit will move as the eyes of the world are on this country. And instead of looking at the difficult things, the the, the stories of the growth of the kingdom of God will will start to hit the headlines. And many, many will come uh, to know you as Lord and Savior. And, Father, just for ourselves as we enter into a new week, we pray for your spirit to be upon us, to help us to live for you. We pray for those among us who are sick. We think of the Logans as, as Ruth and Andrew fly off to, to Newcastle today to begin the next course of treatment. That you will watch over them and the family at home. And you will keep them safe, Lord, and, and continue, continue to plead for healing. And for others who are in hospital, those who are at home unwell, again, we pray for your presence and your healing touch upon them. So, Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for this wonderful, wonderful time together. And may you be glorified and magnified. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing an old hymn. An old, old hymn. But we are faced with temptation. Every day we open our eyes until we close it. Temptation to lead us away from the Lord and walk in a way that doesn't bring him glory. Doesn't bring him honor, but brings uh, shame upon his name. This is a simple song that says, Yield not to temptation.
was just a reminder, please, if you're staying for soup lunch, through the front door, through the main door, please, and the ladies then will, will look after you. But let's, let's pray. Father, thank you for our time together. Thank you for the bread of life that you have broken before us and fed us to strengthen our souls, Lord, so that we will walk more faithfully with you. And thank you for the food that is uh, over, waiting for us over in the hall. Thank you for all the ladies who have worked hard to prepare it and to set it up and will serve us. Father, may you bless their bodies and may our time together be a time honouring unto you and strengthening of your church. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, with us all now and forevermore. Amen.